the system anyway, right? Because it like records all through the room and um <clears throat> inside the house, the whole place. Yeah, inside the house, which if you didn't know it was the building that the uh Nazi the German Nazis picked uh, to be their British headquarters uh, um, once if they were uh, to be successful in their conquering this uh, island here. So as you can tell, this is uh, yeah, so here we are, something completely different, and something in fact, I think I'm really excited about this uh, book, which I've just been reading, um, that we are uh, launching with our first official first event. Um, <laughs> incredibly honored and, and privileged and happy that and thrilled that you chose us to uh, allow to have the first event um, of your amazing new book and um yeah so transform futures and abolitionist ethics for transfeminist worlds incredibly timely incredibly <laughs> urgent incredibly needed to be read by everyone now Everyone, everyone, and not just everyone in the room, but everyone online and everyone in the world as well. So, um, yeah, so my name is River uh, Barris, and I work here at SOAS Brand New, and um, I, I run together with Susanna, the uh, Center for Law and Social Change. And um, basically, we're, um, yeah, sorry, I'm going to take this off for now. Um, it forced me to tell you about the fire exits, the fire alarms. If there is a fire alarm, uh, please uh, let's all get out of the building by the stairs and gather on Mallet Place, which is kind of there if you're looking at the window. Um, there's uh, toilets um, on, the, on this floor where you came in um, that we made gender neutral for or all gender for the uh, occasion um, because they should be anyway all the time anyway. But, you know, we're subverting the institutions as we go. Um, there's, hmm? I said I'm working on it. Great, yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, and that's it. So we are recording the session, I hope. <laughs> um, so keep that in mind. We are going to be circulating the uh, recording and putting it on our YouTube uh, channel as well. Uh, where you can also watch uh, some of our previous events. Um, if you're on Zoom and you have a question, then do please write in the chat. Um, that would be great. And there's somebody who's uh, reading everything that you're saying there and um, can read it out for us. Um, the way, what we're going to be doing is we're going to have um, us, uh, yeah, so the Centre for Law and Social Change moves over from City University to SOAS. And we've been, we existed for four years there, and now we're here and we're continuing a program of radical, um, uh, actively anti racist, feminist, and decolonial events and uh, projects. Um, we're collaborating today with uh, an, another collective that um, I'm part of, and some of us are here as well, uh, called Kiri Homo. So maybe Bruno or Michelina, you'd like to. Yeah, but uh, first go. I mean, there's more of us here. Sam <laughs> is here and uh, Jules is here. Uh, very excited to be Yeah, mm -hmm. there's there's lots of us. Um, there's lots of us. Here. Yeah, yeah. That's so the cool. t-shirt that I don't know why we're not like I didn't bring mine, but we, <laughs> we have t-shirts made as well. Uh, so we are basically a collective of five sort of researchers and, and organizers. Uh, we met for the first time in Berlin last, last year, last September, and our main goal was basically doing a bigger conference slash sort of political workshop for a few days in Barcelona mm -hmm. in June. Um, so yeah, we're mostly now trying to figure out funding for that. Uh, so if anyone has any ideas for funding, we're always happy to hear those. Um, and you can find us on Instagram. Uh, and yeah, we basically try to do events that can help us fund the country, you know. Yeah, we're basically interested in bringing Marxism and sexuality studies, gender studies together in a way that doesn't reproduce 
actual structures of power and trying to build a concept of revolution that takes account of the different configurations of sex and gender, <coughs> race, and all these complex things. We also had a party in Barcelona uh, in July during HM Barcelona and a panel uh, presenting officially the group. And in the May, party was a bigger success. Than yeah, the <laughs> it was very fun. <laughs> and we're having this conference hopefully in June 2025 yeah. in Barcelona. So everyone is obviously invited, uh, not just people who are academics, but everyone who wants to sort of participate. Uh, we are planning to do a sort of very open call for contributions, workshops, uh, all kinds of formats are sort of welcome. Uh, so we're going to be putting that out probably in the next two months or something, and the plan is to do it in June. Um, and I think that's that's enough for us. Yeah. When you next meet? When's the next meeting? Because you we, you meet on Zoom. We meet on Zoom. So the next meeting is to be I think there is to a... be announced because we are we are constantly running into our schedule <laughs> <and> this <laughs> usual <laughs> usual issue. But like definitely second half of November we are going to meet. So you can find us on Instagram, but we also have a sort of email a mailing list. So if you contact us through Instagram. We can add you to the mailing list and then you can receive like updates about meetings and if you'd like to sort of know about what we're doing yeah, yeah. when we're meeting. And the Center for Law and Social Change you can also find on Twitter and we will be um, like spreading the word once the call for participation is out as well. So yeah. that's basically it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and one of the key things I think, and that, that's also why we're so excited to have uh, you both here today, is that it is explicitly both the work of the centre and the work of q to homo explicitly. Um, right. uh, They're asking for what the name is. Uh, q to homo. Yeah. Um, so you write that in the chat. Yeah. Um, so explicitly uh, practice oriented. Um, so theory in the service of practice, right? Theory and historical and her historical materials are in the service of practice, right? And that's what I think is also really great about your book as well, that it's, I know that we're all academics, but we all want a different, well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we have jobs within the institutions, thankfully, that pays our, our salary, definitely, <laughs> for now, uh, but, <laughs> We, you know, we're also people who are building towards a different world, right? And that is, I think, so uh, important to make that explicit and to make that like a, a, a the, the key underlying like aspect of why we do all the work that we do. So I think that's, uh, for me, that's one of the, the things that makes me so excited about this book because it, it, it mobilizes a lot of, um, but, you know, philosophical concepts, and it, it actually breaks down a lot of stuff that maybe you would only read in really dense text, but it breaks it down into like a really usable and like a readable text that people can can take away and actually um, use to to think through their relationships, through their community, and through the work that they do in the world and how they see themselves operating in the world. And, that's like an amazing feat that you um, both um, accomplished, I think, in this in this book. To <clears throat> um, all right, so I'm going to be introducing our uh, speakers now. Uh, so, um, uh, Dr. Nat Raha, first of all, on my right, is a poet and activist scholar. Uh, her books of poetry include Apparitions, Minds in Brackets, uh, published this year. And Off Sirens, Body and Fault Lines, uh, published 2018. And Nat has been involved in queer and trans collective organizing in Edinburgh, London, and beyond for over a decade. Nat's creative and critical writing appears in The Brooklyn Rail, Queer Print in Europe, Transgender Marxism, um, Third Text, Imagining Queer Europe, Event and Now Together, and <laughs> South Atlantic Quarterly. Uh, Matt is a lecturer in fine art critical studies at the Glasgow School of Art. 
And then, um, far right. <laughs> far right. <laughs> For you at the far left. <laughs> it's like Marxism to anarchism spectrum. Right? <laughs> I don't know. It's a spectrum. Uh, so Michael van der Drift is a tutor at the Royal College of Art in London. Michael works in various collaborations and collectives on transfeminism and cultural the theory and has an arts practice in media and performance. Michael is also a founding member of the Red Forest Arts Collective and co-chair of the RCA Who's You. Yes. <laughs> join the union, join the union. Um, brilliant. So, <laughs> First of all, um, I just want to give even more praise on this amazing book, and I've selected a couple of um, quotes that really resonated with me. So, for example, um, the avoidance of radical ethics by focusing on identity hinders movement building and thereby actual liberation. So there's a lot of these sort of mic drop moments in the book that make you pause and think, and let me read that again, and let me maybe put that on a poster and stick it on my wall, because I think that, and those, those, um, those sort of mic drop sentences are like encapsulated, especially um, ones like this one, what the book is about, right? So moving away from this transliberal narrative towards something radical and transformative. So I'll let you do most of the talking about that, of course. But I wanted to um, just have a couple more quotes that I really loved. A politics of solidarity situates our differences in connection, where working towards liberation is a shared endeavor. The politics of demands, on the other hand, aimed at institutions fragment <coughs> collective needs by forcing them to be presented as interests and, in and inclusion that are cut off by the lens of repression. <coughs> And then, especially for this moment, I think this is very apt, um, a pervasive, banal and everyday mascul masculinized carelessness and indifference, which is the effect of an over empower agency, underwrites a femini feminized fear that leads to investing in a centralized power, a power that will keep such aggressive mas masculine sociality in check. I think that for this moment, for this week, that is the <laughs> that for me. Um, so yeah, so um, I'm going to start with the questions, and I'm just going to throw them out there, and you can choose between you who would like we'll, to. We'll, we'll talk to them together. Talk yeah. to them together, great. Um, so first of all, I wanted to um, ask you about, because you're giving perhaps um, a really interesting take of, of what fem means, right? So uh, the blurb of the book on the back, it's, it says, fem describes a constellation of queer gendered expressions that uproot expectations of what it means to be feminine. And so what I get from the book is that fem is not about gender, but it's about ethics. It's an, it is an ethic. So I wondered if you could say more about that. What is fem? <coughs> Like yeah, go for it. Okay, so uh, thanks all for uh, for the patience also. Uh, and now we're here. And uh, so let's say fem. Uh, we started to work on that back in the day when we were living together uh, <laughs> in a co-working story. And one of the things there's always this, this kind of like difficult moments in trans theory or queer theory, where at some point one of in the always read big binary pipes of like, it's not only about trans women, it's only about trans men. Uh, and we, we've got a bit thinking about it, like, why is this forever happening, right? Um, and then we started to think, like, how, why do we think that differently through femme? And then we were, so what we see is often a fairly masculinized approach, is a bit the idea of, I am going to do this now, right? It's very quite intentional. And what we saw is, uh, what we see as fem is quite often already relational. It is like uh, to, to be uh, situated, not, not necessarily in connection, but at least in spaces with others. Um, 
And we started to take that as a starting point. And then we started to take that as a starting point because we wanted to move out of intention. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this. This collective is going to do this differently. And instead of seeing like, like what, what do we do to bring people together? But this, despite the intention sometimes, or when we are part of collectives, where oh, we don't really like where it's going, but you don't also really want to give it up already. You know, so you stay and you negotiate and you talk a bit with people, you try to bring people a bit back together, you try to open it up a bit, and then that doesn't always work. And we saw that that's very strongly uh, a femme approach, femme labor, and femme, femme sociality. And so we decided like, let's write from this. What happens if we take that as the approach rather than the, the intentionality is the first approach and the femme is the second approach? Let's say that what, what happens when we situate that? The relationality primary. So there's also like, hi. <laughs> um, I think in that there's something about, so we, we think a bit about like femme as situated within collectivity. So there is this sense of like how femme in, like shifts or um, creates certain kinds of engagement or particular ways of like thinking or looking or more of a like also kind of like feeling, I don't mean like emotionally, I mean like sensorily, um, through both the world, but also in terms of how we come together. So it's the sense of like, okay, so if we have this premise where like gender is a is like a collective production, right? It exists through our relations with each other, that ultimately we're all trying to like um, have agency over. I think that's the goal, maybe like one of the goals of trans liberation. Um, Fem is also like a way of actually, like it's influencing how we come together, what kinds of space we're trying to create together. Um, and that's both like, there's like aesthetics in that. There's also this question around like what kinds of gendered practices emerge from that. And I think this goes from both the extremes of like, you know, like how we find ways to express ourselves within space, but also how spaces express themselves to us, right? Mm -hmm. And like, you know, think about all of the queer spaces we've been, you've been to in your lives, right? What's the vibe? It's probably like, we're probably like hanging on for dear life, trying to fight <laughs> gentrification. It's probably not much, not very comfortable, probably not very well decorated, right? And so it's like, <laughs> what kind of world? It's like, I was thinking about this this morning, <laughs> it's like, oh, it's like, um, what would what would a world without flowers look like? Mm. You know, it's not a world we kind of want. So there's something in that. But then I also think it's like, why femme is also from this, degree of the hypercriticality of like femininity that we all have to like fight basically, which is um, on the one hand is like the classic like, trans misogyny, you know, like you can't do, if you do any kind of femininity, you're immediately doing it wrong or you're not entitled to do it and you're under attack. But it's also misogyny in the broader sense, right? It's like, oh, if you're expressing yourselves in these ways, you're not serious, you're not intellectual, you know, it's like, it's, um, uh everything from uh decorative to um trivial and it's like no actually like this this stuff matters right especially in this moment when we're like oh yeah this like masculine world building that we've been stuck is literally like you know we're left with like fascism and neoliberalism mm -hmm. and fascism mm -hmm. and there's no fun in any of that so mm -hmm. we're you know we may as well enjoy ourselves when we're trying to destroy the world, you know, <laughs> that, that world. It's also a different, like, uh, way of thinking, right, where, where patriarchy is always hierarchical and purifying, which is why it's bad for all genders, right? It's, patriarchy is terrible for men as well. Um, then I think feminist is always the elaboration and the ornamentation, where not everything, you know, you just stick things on, and not everything is really necessary, or this is the essence of it, or the pure, the pure expression of it. That's kind of like we both work in art school, so we have a lot to do with this. No, no, do less is more kind of stuff. Like it's kind of you know, and we are like, no, more is more. Sometimes just more, stick things on, it's fine. And then at some point you, you see that you forgot about them, and it's also fine. You know, it, it, you don't need to always cut down and cut down and purify. And I think this is the like the sort of the aesthetics of the of the politics to sort of go open and vanish, and then it can flow out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really saw that how uh, fem is kind of the opposite of the individualized uh, purity politics mm. that's going to be by definition unsuccessful in, in uh, liberating us. 
uh, a change in the world. Now, so opposite to uh, them, you use this concept of separability uh, from Denise Ferreira de Silva, who features quite heavily in, in, in the book. And um, so this concept of separability, I, it was new to me. It wasn't uh, something I've come across before. So it comes up again in each uh, chapter and seems absolutely essential to your argument. So I wondered if you could explain a little bit what uh, is meant by separability and how it features in your work. Yeah, I can start. Um, I guess so in terms of Denise Ferrer Silver kind of makes this argument in the mid middle of the last decade being like separability is the overarching dynamic of contemporary Europe in terms of like the overarching social dynamic of contemporary Europe. She's thinking about the, you know, so-called migrant crisis, like, you know, it's like, which is actually this crisis of like, uh, Europe's violence, you know, and the extremities of Europe's violence aimed at, uh, like, people who are trying to transfer the Mediterranean to be here for, what, you know, for reasons of having better life, maybe earning money, uh, of various motives. But um, that this, this social dynamic is being reproduced in different ways. And, like, I think I'm, I'm we've been talking a little bit about, like, the different degrees of, uh, what do we say, like different levels of thinking, different modes of thinking about this work. So like, we, I think separability is also useful as a tool to like think through how we understand class relations, how we understand gender divisions, whatever. Um, but the idea is that it's, it influences our social worlds and how our social worlds cohere, who's in our social worlds. So that's kind of what we're trying to do with it. Be like, mm -hmm. actually part of the project of, uh, a, po a project of a politics or a practice of solidarity is to ultimately break down the divisions that structure our social worlds, right? Mm -hmm. Be that class divisions, be that institutional ones, say being in university and, this, and the struggle to reach out. Um, and solidarity is a means of doing that, but we have to understand what that actually looks like or what actually happens. You know, so that's, I think we spend a whole chunk of book trying to and thinking through that question. So on the one hand, it's being like there are these forms of separability that are at play. On the other, how do we break them down? And like next to that, in particular in relation to trans, we're thinking a bit about this stuff around this like question around uh, like the role of the law and like kind of like the limit of both the struggle for like GRA reform in, in like a UK context in terms of right, legal gender recognition. I'm really thinking about like, what is the, like why is the law like so hell bent on maintaining a gender binary? And what kinds of divisions is it looking to reproduce or maintain in order to cohere its own social structure? So I think that's like maybe where some of the like these scores are analytic. Yeah. I think also one of the, to elaborate only a tiny bit because not said most of it, I think one of the things we, we see in the, the sort of mm. affirmative reconstitution with certain identities, if people don't want to go to innocence anymore, like, oh, I get all this oppression, but it's really not my fault, uh, then people have not so much left and then superiority becomes, oh, trans people are just better than cis people, you know. You get this kind of like, mm, a bit of resentment driven, um, uh, oper operations, which is also what we think are separability, right? It is all kind of emotional structures that consistently keep us apart. And we see this also sometimes at the level of solidarities, we see the structures that keep us apart. Oh, but you're this one, like, uh, rather than already embracing and already stepping in and just go uh, drop from uh, a sort of Eurocentric knowledge based regime to a practical regime where you just do things together. Um, and I think through that partly because um, I was, I have grow, I grew up in the countryside um, and there's just less people than in the city. And so socializing the countryside, you just situate around a certain thing and you do the certain thing with the people that are available to do the certain thing, rather than in cities where you do certain, certain things with people that have similar identities. So, or, gays do this thing, the lesbians do that thing. In the countryside, it doesn't work like that. Like, do people want to grow pumpkins on oh, you and you and you? Okay, well, we can better <laughs> get to like each other, you know? We're just going to grow those pumpkins and more things. And to run the scouting group. Uh, and the scouting group, I was part of the scouting group because there was not nothing to do, obviously. It was run by punks who took it over. It was really hilarious. And they taught us how to smoke dope, how to reach <laughs> you know? But you start to do it. And these people were available to train us to do that. And then we are like, Ha! Huh. 
And it was a very like segregated countryside, right? The Catholics were not much in, in mixing with the Protestants. Uh, so it was still going on there. And at the same time, you have this, uh, this, this really mixing of everybody, oh, we're going to do this, sometimes liberalistically. Mm. And I think that formed really practically, like we want to go more there, even if we don't want to go to the countryside, we want to do that here. We want to get together because we want to do something together, rather than knowledge-driven, oh, I, th I, I think about you like this and I think about you like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, we, have to get the, we have to let go of that stuff. It's, uh, like, mm -hmm. So it's like if we are decentering identity in both like our critical analysis and then also logically like mm -hmm. in how we think about our social worlds and we focus on practices, because we're talking about the word liberation, right? Uh, in our everyday lives, you can't really rely on one hand, like you can't rely on identity as the thing that coheres is the reason we come together. And also it means that we have to question and address like who our practices are for. And I think about this a lot in terms of a particular mutual project I was a part of around the time we started working on the book. Um, or maybe before it was during it was during the first lockdown. Um, you know, we did a little survey of like who we're reaching out and it's like, oh. There's like no one under 35 is receiving, is involved in our mutual, in the mutual aid outreach, you know, mm. and that's a real, it shows a lot about how uh, that as a queer and trans mutual aid project, it was centered around youth culture, right? Mm. And it's like, mm. it's COVID-19, like Jesus Christ, you know, who is, who is this affecting really? And it's not like there aren't older queer and trans people that we're trying to reach out to, but it says something about, okay, so what do we have to change to, to actually shift that? I don't want to say that, you know, I don't, I'm sorry, I, just, I don't think that sounds liberal, but like it is this question around like, okay, so how do we orient our ethics? How do we actually begin, you know, you have to start from a different premise if you want to engage in that way. And the other reason why you cite Denise Ferreira Silva is because her texts are really fucking difficult. <laughs> uh, and we love that because, <laughs> no, no, seriously, because when you get to work with really difficult work, you feel how practical it is. Denise is not just a, a, a sort of balloon up in the sky theorist, right? She really thinks about life down here, but it, you need to make the translation. And we hope to show in our book, because I love theory, I love theory, that theory can be translated down and back translated up, right? Also there, there is no separability between these two things. The one is not better than the other. They're all happening at the same time, all the time. And also the means though, is so difficult. Is, is there with us in practice. Yeah. Yeah, great, yeah. Um, and you really did that really well. Like, I feel I understand uh, Denise had three <laughs> work. Um, yeah, and the other key concepts. Unpayable debt reading group. <laughs> Who wants to start the unpayable debt reading group? Yeah. <laughs> That's gonna touch, yeah. Um, the other key concept is uh, complicity. So perhaps in some ways um, it's about admitting uh, that uh, admitting and being comfortable with our failure in uh, our everyday lives, right? And so to not have that purity politics or that desire for uh, moral and political purity. So the messiness that you also mentioned earlier, um, in our, uh, you know, including in our jobs and as we uh, do engage with, um, uh, with institutions such as the university uh, every day. And so how do we manage and how do we uh, manage inside those institutions while staying also focused and not gar getting carried away with uh, or getting sort of drawn into the institutional politics and perhaps uh, so I wondered if that's um, if that makes sense to my reading of complicity or or if um, can you say more about complicity? Yeah I'll tell you, uh, it's very nice that you bring it up because I think the first public lecture we did yeah. when we were writing was at SOAS on complicity, so it's very nice to bring that back here. Uh, it was online because I think it was still pandemic times. Yeah. yeah, it was still pandemic times. And it was really sweet and we were very warmly welcomed and we had a very nice discussion. Um, so we started to think of complicity partly because in 2014, Jackie Wang wrote the Against Innocence piece. Then Gloria Wecker wrote in 2016, the White Innocence book, right? It was a translation of an older Dutch book, but uh, it came out in English in that time. Uh, and so we, said we, we were wrestling a bit with that innocence issue, right? But so it's easy to say like, okay, no more innocence, but then what? Uh, and so you see 
especially in the social media space, which I left behind, you see the superiority moments coming up as then an other option, but we never found a good other answer. Uh, and then I think when we started to work on this, complicity became the, for a sort of key term that we could use to anchor ourselves, because it is both the, the being folded in, com complete, so folded with in the world, because you are always in the world, but not as a sort of um, an Arcadia state of purity where everything is fine. You know, it is not always fine because at the moment, if we form a sort of a gang uh, and you want to join us and we're just oh, busy with each other or we're organizing like, oh, this is fantastic collective, but we just organize it as a friend group and you feel a bit on the outside, then we are just also in a structure where we hold people out, right? And not because we're baddies or hanging out with the baddies, but because uh, we forgot to open up at some point, right? We forgot to leave our friendships outside of a public space uh, or the friendships come into the public space, but we forget to, 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 to weave enough openness in so that other people feel welcome and open and, and have agency in the collective, right? And so we started to think as complicity is more a sort of thing that is not like, oh yeah, shit, I work for this. And we sit here in the Senate house, uh, which is obviously a building made for babies. Um, <laughs> but, or we work at uh, the, the College of Arts, uh, which we learned yesterday that King has to sign off things, which I find ludicrous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's absolute bullshit. Um, and does that make me complicit? Yeah, sure, it makes me complicit in an uninteresting way, I think. But what I find in a more interesting way is the moments where I have been part of a collective where I was maybe not reachable or we were this organizer or I was this organizer that was working all the time, all the time, all the time and had actually no time to sit around with people for who or with who I organized, right? So that I slowly lost myself in the work and lose touch with the sociality that the work is made with. And so then I think about like, look, that, that is the point. <laughs> uh, that is the point where I go, complicity helps me to think about my own actions as working against what I hope to, hope to do in this world. And this is why I think it's such a helpful term. Because it also, I mean, damn, if you give me power, I'm not better than anyone, right? So this is why we have to, to know that we're no better than anyone. So keep the power away, keep the power away from me. Like I will be complicit in the bad sense. So I better say I'm complicit when I'm still trying to work in the right way. Not really. Making notes. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we work all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I was thinking about it because also like complicity is an interesting one, right? Because what we spent the last year trying to do right we've been on the you know it's like solidarity not complicity is like the phrase that mm. I think is like the the common thing on the banner and mm. the all of the Palestine movement that I've been involved in up north and um and so it's a question around like yeah what does it mean to make an active claim to complicity again to be involved and part of this is also a shift from criticality as a mode of uh, um, or like, well, not the task, let me say this again, it's shift away from critique as the mode of analysis. So it's like, okay, so rather than saying, you know, like, the nation state is evil because we're still selling arms to Israel, and saying like, okay, sure, we can make that critique, but what does that do materially? We can critique until the cows come home and we'll go home and the arms will still be sold tomorrow. And so that is this question of like, okay, so how does complicity shift our agency in relation to that so it's like okay so we're all here there are all things we can do with our bodies they're all well, some some of us can do our bodies and then there are questions around like so if it's again to focus it back into action it means that that's to give ourselves back our agency in these contexts right rather than just being like oh we're being held by power we're being held down. um and yeah i think maybe you just stated really nicely in terms of this question around like this isn't just like an us versus them big political thing. It's also about how we bring these dynamics into our sub-organized spaces, into our collectives, into the spaces where, which yeah, we've made for the sake, for our own sake, we give, we're there because we want to be there, um, rather than it just being about the places that we have to be, we need to be there for money or for work or for jobs or for to study or for whatever. Um, so yeah, so it's this also this interrelation between like 
how we bring how institutional thinking bleeds into our into our into our lives in the way that we want to actually make our lives. Yeah. Okay, cool. I want to just broaden it out a little bit and, and look at how you so one of the really great things about the book is how you situate them historically within the emergence of racial capitalism within and against imperialism. So I wondered why um, how do you situate why now? Why did you feel cool to write this book in the current geopolitical moment? And then you finish uh, with the chapter on abolition. So I wondered if you could say a bit more about uh, what you mean by abolition and what should we, what is in, uh, uh, included, what's on your list of things to be abolished and how are we going to get there? <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to just think out loud. Um, why now? I mean, I feel for us because the kind of the kind of like why now question is kind of framed much more broadly in relation to like what's been happening with trans politics in like the last ten years or longer, ten plus years. But um, which is also to say that like, Maker and have been like working together, organizing together, working together for about ten years. Um, and when we began our premise and, and specifically doing work around under trans feminism, our premise was like, oh, we don't want to just have an, a conversation that's anti about anti turf because trans feminism at that time, this is like 2014, um, was entirely an anti turf feminism. That was like its, its degree we did. It was about here's what the here's what the trans folks think. Here's what we think. And so we were like, oh, what happens if we set that aside and actually just try what happens when we start trying to think about what we really want to think and not in this kind of in this like polar being polarized by people who don't want us to exist um and so obviously <laughs> like we've had a few good years and then 2017 happened you know trump got elected and um we got involved in this like you know we're awake all night in the emergency this kind of moment and then um and and also thinking about radical practices in that time and then uh, meanwhile, this kind of trans liberal framework of like rights, rights, <laughs> rights, 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 kind of just took over the whole intellectual, the whole space, right? And I think it's just like, I don't, uh, this wasn't our plan that this book would come out after like trans liberalism is just like, uh, like RIP trans liberalism. Um, I was actually going to write an essay on the postmortem of trans liberalism as like after having written this book. And then somebody else was like, oh no, this book is the postmortem. I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> Fine. But um, actually, what does that mean? It leaves a political vacuum for the kind of things we want to do. And also, like, we're really not interested in this question around uh, legal enfranchisement in the frame of the nation state. And sure, I'm not saying that that's bad or that at times that's not necessary, but. Um, there are other things to what trans politics means or what trans feminism means. Mm. And so that's like, yeah, I think we kind of know that, right? It's mm. just not clear to us because there isn't necessarily a discourse about it. So but maybe the why now, I think we can come back to that, we can get into abolition. Yeah, I think, like we've your work on the corporation has been really helpful in that sense, right? The corporation as a person. And I think one of the things that we want to abolish is, uh, as a union organizer, it's just management. <laughs> uh, it's just sort of management has to go uh, everywhere. Also the manager that is here, the you know, the manager that we bring along, or the manager that knows everything a little bit better and comes to tell you when you're wrong, is really basic, like the Jewish kind of experience, like the manager around every corner comes to tell you. Uh, um, so that is, we, we start partly working towards it, um, towards that idea of ab abolition, writing, not only we write about borders, we write about rights as no to the nation state, no to the nation states that, that, that holds us inside, um, but also no to the corporations and the institutions that require management. Right, because that is not once gave me a cap, annihilate management. <laughs> 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 I was like, yes, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> it's for the picket. It's for the picket. It's going a bit too fast. <laughs> um, and so we go from there, and then I think abolition also on the prison because we do we do write about that. 
uh, abolition on the military complex, right? But abolition is also closer. It's the HR department. <laughs> it is. It is the vice chancellor. It is the dean. Place dean. <laughs> Um, and so we take it really, really from there because one of the um, things we sometimes see in organizing is that people make an organization and the organization lasts for a few years and then there's oh, there's a sort of stress around it, like we have to make the organization more or realer and then the organization gets funding and then the organization starts to get funding to get funding. And becomes a charity, and a charity needs a manager, and an NGO needs a manager, and then somehow the, the 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 institution becomes more important than the people in it or the people that work with it, and that is the moment abolition needs to happen. So, what we feel and what we talked about, and we worked in some not so successful collectives together, um, is that the falling apart of collectives is a sign of their success. It is a sign. It is the moment that the, that the collective reached the point where it can fall apart and people that leave it are seeds. And when you are a seed, it is your job to undo your resentment, bring your learning to the next space where you come together. Because we do not need new institutions, not us, if they're made by us. But we need to keep getting together and getting together. And therefore, we also need to be able to let it go. And there's a whole, there's a, like, there's a whole layer of things in this question around like what happens when the collective uh, disbands, and some of it is like sometimes the knowledge can be can like dissipate out into the world, and then sometimes the collective gets forgotten about, and the work that the collective did disappears from the ecosystem, the social ecology of that space, of that of that place, of that space, of that community, whatever. And but actually, this question around the need to keep doing things that's how the knowledge remains, right? Yeah. It's like so we can be in a collective collective just bounds, we all move to six different places as a result of it. Mm -hmm. But as provided we're still trying to do things in those new spaces in dialogue with the things that can help you there, that's a way of that knowledge continuing. Yeah. Um, which is also to say it's embodied in three practices as well. Yeah. Um, I was thinking quite a bit about this, it's, I think it was like, it's Julie Branson, so we were in a conversation talking about abolition and both that it's the demolition and the remaking. I actually think our book's probably more about the remaking than the demolition. And that's not to say that we don't think about the things that need to go, but I think we try and focus on the making and the, the way of the making and the way that happens. Um, and yeah, I think that, that element of the dialectic is like sometimes missed because we, we do want to tear things down. We can get hard better mm. than tearing things down. And I think mm. this question of like, actually maybe we do have A, some sense of how we're going to try and rebuild these things. and. Actually, we're also trying to say like that does matter. It like the way we do the way we do things, the way we approach our social interactions, the way we approach our work, the way we approach creative collect creating collective. You know, the difference between like beginning the collective with like okay, we're going to eat every day every time we meet, rather than being like cool, we're just going to have meetings. It's going to be in this place. Let's go and turn up in the places like up a flight of stairs and it's freezing cold and like everyone's hungry. That's like how that's not going to be the best form of social. That's going to create a certain kind of limited form of social infrastructure that's going to create other problems in the long run. And that's, you know, that's like that's a basic accessibility kind of form. Yeah. But that is part of the fabric of like, okay, so how are we going to do things? Because then we get asked that question, like, okay, so you're going to ask the police, what are you going to do? You know, and it's like, well, maybe we actually have ways of A, trying to do that, mm. and B, they don't have to be, we don't have to have one way and they don't have to be the right way. Because like we do also learn through fucking up. Yeah. So and it is the thing, like I don't know if you have a manager or you meet managers as a as a <laughs> well, there's one in your head. Yeah, yeah, one in your head. head. Yeah, yeah, or 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 shake them off. <laughs> Any managers. <laughs> but like I'm meeting managers all the damn time at the moment. Uh, and I'm now in you something called the Senate, which is sort of the, the mother of all meetings. It's where all the meetings <laughs> converge. And then I hear management there talking in things that we would also say to each other. Mm -hmm. And it makes me really uh, worried, mm -hmm. you know, because if we have a knowledge based approach, we go like, yeah, see, mm -hmm. we wrote this book. And, but probably the, the vice chancellor at some point asked the uh, marketing and communications department to take a few slogans out of it and then I put it in a newsletter and they feel that I can recognize myself in the organization. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's going to happen? It's very predictable. But one of the things that is 
uh, consistence mm -hmm. and what we constantly, but we're all, I think, very good at seeing is where management doesn't give up control. And this is where we say, why well, we start from abolition. So the moment you want to give up control, you can start to work with these words and give them meaning. Mm -hmm. But uh, you don't want to give up control, these words are meaningless. And they can just be cited in a meaningless way. And we can all recognize it when it's meaningless. <coughs> I had some more questions, but I'm I'm actually thinking maybe it's the, now is a good moment to move to to you moving. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Are you into that? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you come from the seventies. You watch children's shows. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Uh, cool. I can't remember what color the. Okay, okay. Wait, cool. Is somebody open the window? Uh, yeah. The windows are. The windows are Shall I open it a bit more? You can open some of the. Cool. Uh, let me take a sip of water. Uh, Wait, are we do the version of the Yeah, we started with one first. The one that we can also do the other one. Yeah. Cool. So we're going to read about uh, in two from two different parts uh, of the book. This uh, is near the end of chapter four on uh, medical institutions. Yeah. Um, and the, the chapter is called "Liberatory Harm Reduction: A Proposal to Rethink Autonomy." Um, I will take you there to the end. Um, to think through strategies to deal with the dire state of chance healthcare, we will look at Shira Hassan's work on liberatory harm reduction. While Hassan's work emerges from the social dynamics of substance use, there are insights that are very helpful for a reconceptualization of the ethics surrounding trans healthcare. This is in part because Hassan thinks through a strong abolitionist framework and is working from a deep understanding of the violence within institutions and institutionalized violence. Let's start with a particularly devastating insight from Sarah Daoud. One easy way to know for sure that corporate nonprofits aren't practicing liberation harm reduction. They're the same ones doling out punishments that keep people unsafe and unwell, that force you into compliance over self-determination forcibly medicating you or sterilizing you and on and on and on. They're supposed to be where you get help, but often they're actually sites of violence. It creates a culture where young folks, where young folks are afraid to ask for help because help usually comes with harm and control. While we will talk about self-determination later, here let's focus on the problem that asking for help usually comes with harm and control. The moment people get to choose their own directions in life, a sense of agency enables the imaginations of other worlds. One is not in these moments constrained by categories of perception that others use to impose limits on them. However, as we discussed in chapter three, uh, the roots of institutions is that they only offer choices of pre-existing pathways in the institution. <coughs> Sarah Dury concludes, these systems could seek to control us, punish us for being defiant, and then toss us out when we can't function as they demand, end quote. When engaging medical institutions, and here we differ from some of the uh, staging of Hassan's discussion, it seems unlikely that we would be able to choose our way out of the mess of violence, condensation, condensation, condescension, and bad care. There is something else we need, something that stretches beyond individualized agency to tackle the limiting approaches of institutions. The four pillars of medical ethics are benevolence, no maleficence, autonomy and informed consent. This sounds great. <laughs> However, the forced sterilization of trans people in Europe were carried out under the banner of these four pillars. Pathologization of trans people, punishment culture, and the endemic condescension of clinicians can be made to fit into these approaches. This is in part because they are quite abstract and in part because medical institutions are structured very hierarchically. 
Informed consent in a hierarchical and specialized environment, environment can amount to little more than giving doctors permission to do what they think is necessary when the, patho when the pathology is structured around social evaluation, such as trials. In specialized care, informed consent should mean that people understand what will happen, what the other options are, and what their expectations are following medical intervention. However, in trans care, informed consent has often meant compliance with the clinician's pathology rather than agency about what one actually wants. In contrast to formal medical ethics, deliberatory harm reduction framework starts from the user and their space for agency in limiting conditions, bodily, mentally, socially, structurally, and institutionally, and stretches that out into an abolitionist approach. This last step enables extending from individualized people who have to make their own choices to collectives supporting the navigation of supporting and hostile systems. The very three harm reduction is a strategy for organizing, for organizing for survival and building collectives emerging from black and brown trans people, such as Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, Miss Major, Griffin Gacy. Tourmaline considers it a gift, and as, and as such, it should be accepted with grace and treated with respect. It is a strategy for action against disposability. Uh, to cite a part of the definition, this is from Shira Hassan. Liberatory harm, re harm reduction is a philosophy that teaches us to accompany each other as we transform the root causes of harm in our lives. We put our values into action using real life strategies to reduce the negative health, legal and social consequences that result from criminalized and stigmatized life experiences. Liberatory harm reduction, reductionists support each other and our communities without judgment or stigma or coercion, and we do not force others to change. Liberatory harm reduction is a true self-determination and total bodily autonomy, total body autonomy. This way of seeing helps us to imagine and practice ways of supporting each other through transformation and how to work against stigma without coercion. <laughs> At times, trans people in Europe call for informed consent, but here we want to emphasize that liberatory harm reduction offers better strategies to think through our engagement with medical institutions. It emerges from abolitionist frameworks and does not ultimately see the institution as the savior that needs to be made to include trans folk. We might need the medical institution as a service provider and a resource distributor, but once we are in contact with them as users, it is key to emphasize harm reduction. And most of all, approaching trans healthcare as a body loving practice. Reading those words in Hassan's description of uh, Sexy, a young people's needle exchange program in Chicago, left me like a thunderstruck. It framed in a flash how body hating the treatment at the Free Gender Clinic in Amsterdam had been. This body hating emerges in part from the emphasis in medical circles that only by adapting the body to the pathologized mind will allow a transgender healing of sorts. In the 1990s and 2000s, there was a lot of talk amongst trans people about hating their own bodies. The born in the wrong body trope was really alive and kicking when I started doing this stuff. Um, from my background as a dancer, this was not my story, but it was hard to escape its pressure, isolated <laughs> in an environment that holds no love for who body and mind you are. For starters, one had to convince the psychologist that one was depressed, but only because of transness, not for any other reason at all. <laughs> so one had to self-pathologize and display sadness to access medication. The endocrinologists minus one were indifferent. And to this day, I am aware of how a lighter dose of testosterone suppressor might have changed my entire perception of how to navigate my time at the clinic. The dose they prescribed, as was then standard, was high and numbed an entire section of our body minds. This was done because we wanted it, without there being a conversation about whether we wanted a numb pelvic region. Instead, if one questioned something, one was threatened with being pushed out of the program, harming control indeed. How differently will a clinic group if it centers on body-loving practices? 
This thought returns us lovingly to Travis Alabanza's reminder that we do this for us, baby. The musings that baby is a term of endearment, sometimes a reminder of her youth, and that like the baby, I could start again and mold and shift and learn to talk again if I must. Seriously, we have only one body mind and we get to do everything with ourselves, be that self medding substance use, sex, work and play, etc. It is this bodily being that we better surround with care and love rather than with clinical approaches based on rejecting ourselves, which is yet another normative strategy for harming trans people. In light of this discussion, Another leading political aim is slogan that he used further reflection is full bodily autonomy. Our hesitation with this idea arises from philosophical, ethical, and strategic angles. We affirm the idea that when a decision comes to one's body mind, uh, we affirm the idea that when a decision comes close to one's body mind, is about what happens to oneself, or even which actions to take. There needs to be a sense of agency and the possibility of being responsible for oneself. This is what undergirds the 21st century principle demands for autonomy, including for abortion rights. However, the, an emphasis on personal choice, which is where radical liberal approaches meet, in this case, uh, within a neoliberal environment, emphasizes empowering the individual. As we discussed in chapter three, when one pits the individual against the institution, the individual loses. It is a real question of how much autonomy how much autonomy can rescue oneself in a hostile environment. It also puts a huge demand on people to make it through institutions by their own wits, rather than supported by a collective. To navigate institutions is a middle class asset, <coughs> and some people have not been trained in the skill. I thought you would have something about, you know, future for home. Uh, no, different yeah. kinds of futures and magic, yeah. different, you know, different kinds of trans people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna jump back into chapter three. Okay. Oh, no, no let's just do it. Uh, trans okay. and right. Empire. Oh, shall I copy uh, again? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, yeah. don't. Just do that. Next time, by the way, they will arm my This section is called movements, relations, and collectivity. So it's kind of the concept of the And it's the end of chapter three. To conclude this chapter, we look at how separability is at play in social life. We tie this to our arguments on institutional policy, orders, and the expressions of anti-trans and racist imaginary in contemporary politics. Normative and routinized social skills are related to positions in social forms, although they're not a homogenous set of actions. Adherence to norms can make possible one's inclusion in specific space, in a specific space, while these social routines can at the same time concretely reproduce divisions of class, race, class, gender, racialization, ableism, and more. At other times, norms may also reproduce more localized dynamics such as workplace hierarchies, housing privileges, or institutional belonging. The politics of inclusion means that expectations of who occupies certain positions can shift with the attendant liberal hope uh, it, with a sh a sh for a shift in the change of ethics, shift in ethics. We have discussed how disciplinary power, we discussed how disciplinary power, which made strong claims about social roles, transforms into a softer form with tight organizational control, discusses as soft patriarchy. Uh, this also means that changing expectations around positionalities becomes an integral part of institutional reforms, when previously social markers have meant definite social placement. These changes come with a demand for a modicum of skill in diversity work and are met with active resistance by the right, uh, animating their entitlement, fear, anxieties, hatred of difference and obnoxiousness. When we do see a shift in ethics, people become more adept at managing their expectations on fulfilling who occupies which role. However, the hope that inclusion will introduce a non-exploitative ethics is rarely fulfilled, as the control of structures guarantees a continuation of patriarchy, albeit by a larger range of people occupying a set of positions. This display, the display of morality that inclusion affords 
is only possible through the stabilization of hierarchy, the institutionalization of power generates. It doesn't address how hierarchy creates oppression. So perhaps we can see inclusion <laughs> as an aesthetics, which prevails through visibility rather than an ethics. Inclusion shifts everyday atmospheres within organizations, giving a new flair to their existing relations of control. To hold ourselves against the onslaught of trans misogyny and forms of racist violence inflicted upon the world by patriarchy, we refuse the unfreedoms of choice and individualized power. We work towards freedom in relation that can to be said to be a movement away from an unchosen starting point, but is made together. <laughs> Echoing Harney and Moten, it is collectivity, an unfree sociality in which we are held together. We have proposed neither to think of possibility through the overarching platform of an institution, nor through the possessive individualism of personal choice, where you get it your way. But instead, as part of a collectivity, we aim to reimagine institutional, individualist, and possessive agency. We hold on to each other, refuse to grasp of power, to emerge in collectives and social forms. This is not freedom of speech nor freedom of choice, but a freedom in relation. Liberation through relation may be marked by what Moten and Hardy call indebtedness, without each other and the movement struggle that comes before and is to come and that exists now, we wouldn't be here. By nurturing collectivities that are outside of dominant social forms, an openness can exist that doesn't depend on stable forms of life. <coughs> Mindful of Maria Lebrona's warnings that non-normative collectives also use purification to control their inner workings, that they can police right and wrong, push people out and demand proper behavior, seeking perhaps their own virtuousness or simply respectability. Instead, if we hold on to each other and work to remain in relation, including honing the skills that nurture collectivity, forms of living emerge that can avoid getting ossified in proper forms and remain open. Through openness and refusal, we figure out how to change and transform together, knowing that frictions will emerge and that it will get messy. When sociality is structured around openness, dominant forms need to be refused too. Abolitionism mode of world-making doesn't intend to simply remove harmful and violent structures. Abolitionist practices come with an expressive remaking of alternatives of worlds that emerge directly between us and those who act with us. Compared to institutional inclusion, when there is at best minimal change in the organization of its hierarchies, the anarchic needs to tend to equality. The, the anarchic, oh, sorry, there's a, a semicolon. The anarchic needs to tend to equity. If it intends to dismantle social hierarchies in its twin technology command, Something happened. It's the first edition. There's so many typos. <laughs> <laughs> okay. it's the no, no, I, I, that was a typo. I just missed the same <laughs> Okay. And uh, yeah, we discussed in chapter five such a practice blooms oh, and it's based technology. on an ethics no, yeah, yeah, yeah. of generosity. Sorry, we, no, get, we get used to this later on. It's, it kind of seems like a few months. It's actually not that interesting. <laughs> the first show. While also on the left, the desire persists for a leader or someone to make the world right. Abolition emphasizes that direct transformative quality of working collective, collectively. And abolition itself as a politic is nourished through making space for, other, for people's insights, imaginations, and needs. Abolition works by embracing a multitude of experience, even if working together coalesces around the commonalities in difference confronting pressures that are urgent. Even when we are not directly in the line of fire, we know that to dismantle structures of duress will ultimately benefit all of us, provided we are actively unspooling separability. In this coming together, the experience of institutionalization and its concurrent hearts need witnessing, working against, and growing sensitivity to inform one's ethics. Transition, transformation, and trans practices put in soul, body, minds, and motion through physical space, social circles, cities, or countries, through the change that emerges through our body minds, and through shifts in how we advocate and affirm our genders in our lives. We learn new ways to move, dance, speak, 
describe and joke. We find new means to protest and resist. In such activities, the ethics that emerge require their own balancing act. If we frame exclusion individually or as a community as exceptional and narrate it primarily through a trope of unjust victimization, without understanding its entanglements within systems that harm and obstruct the lives of many, we risk a bourgeois transposition which can be easily met and demobilized by a politics of institutional inclusion. As we, as we argue, entanglement should, only, should not only be understood in a classical sense of complicity, but also through our proposed conceptualization that being a part of the world makes one responsible for it. Victimization, in contrast, explains one's position through innocence and detachment. A trans movement that focuses primarily on unjust exclusion has a tendency to see itself as frictionless, as also does the managerial realm itself. We spent a lot of time talking about friction. Um, this idea has been criticized for ignoring the complexity of duress in favor of a self-referential politics that sacrifices solidarity. Trans refusal as movement can be understood through Hardy and Bolton as collective self-possession where collectivity means that we remain incomplete together. Incompleteness means we are never anything without each other. While some of us might be messy, we learn from the mess. Sometimes we learn about our own hangups and get confronted with our desires for a certain kind of relation. This means that forms can remain flexible and become spaces for becoming, emergence, and change. Through movements, we create space for collective resistance connecting to our surroundings and for collective flourishing. Thanks so much for uh, reading from that. We now want to uh, give you the reader, future readers, uh, a chance to engage. Um, so. Yeah, let us know if you have uh, any questions. And uh, Bruno, you can read out any questions that our comrades on Zoom might have. There uh, are two questions. Two questions. Here. Quick. All right. Um, let's give Hannah the first uh, word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have yeah, two questions. Uh, one question. My first question is like, I just wonder what you would say about. Um, what, what like a fem social movement or feminist inside of social movements might look like, especially in the context of the kind of masculinist milieu that a lot of these movements are embedded in. And then the other thing I wanted to ask is if you could say something about how your work is relevant to, or like how you see the work that you created as being connected with to the kind of crises that are happening right now. Politically. Should we right. take a few, yeah. or do you? Can you give us some examples of? Well, like places. specifically, like sort of rise of the right, um, and like what the what the kind of progressive movement needs to do in this moment, or what you know, where, where we're going. Um, should we should we answer that? Let's answer that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think I thought a lot about a lack of creativity in this in the like masculinist political movement and really reflecting on like what I've seen. I think on one hand, like, I think about uh, my, my feelings on this really begin in the like 2010 to 2013 kind of late, the labor movement around that time in like here in London. Um, but also thinking about like how I see social movement organizing in Scotland where I'm based, where yeah, there's, there is a lack of creativity both in terms of like approach, in terms of action, in terms of purpose, or in terms of like what actually happens in that moment of being together or of like a protest or of whatever, uh, of congregation, I would say. And, and then I see the shift of like, I think sometimes we're organizing is quite good with this, but we're quite good at being like, cool, let's just do something wildly stupid and camp, like, let's, let's introduce high camp theater yeah. into the context of the action. And that is the action. And like, um that say that example isn't necessarily them but it's also like them's kind of in there it's kind of thinking about like yeah again like what does it mean to first think about gender as something that's manifest material uh like i want to kind of say also like beautiful nourish nourishing also 
but in these ways that are not just kind of like getting caught up in stereotypical ideas of femininity. Um, and like what happens when we put that into the movement space? And sometimes that's the work that's like, you know, the, the infrastructure work behind, quote unquote, behind the scenes. But actually sometimes that can be literally up front, you know, that can mm -hmm. be in the street, that can be in the space of it. And then I also think it's just sometimes this question around like, yeah, what do we, what does the movement look like? What do we think of political work, right? And that we still have these quite formal ideas of yeah. political work has to be X, Y, and Z, and it can't be like A, B, C, D, E, or F, because that's not even labor. And like, I think part of the analysis, you know, which is the like the social reproduction analysis, where it's like A, B, C, and D are all forms of labor. So maybe A, B, C, D, E, F, and G are like potentially some other way of doing social movement. The, yeah, has a different kind of confrontation to the state or the power. Yeah. yeah, so I think hmm, if you look at classical femininity, the, the, the work of femininity is to get everybody in the movement to do what the leader, the patriarch, wants, right? So that is the job of the moms in the movement to, no, no, this really don't make best stuff, stay together, stay together, right? You form up behind the leader. And I think as feminists, as the, the, the contrast to femininity, it's the liberated uh, form, it's just to make sure that the, 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 the multi-perspectives stay present. Because I think one of the, um, one of the best ways that I saw a certain form of, uh, when we were a bit more militant, needed to be a bit more militant, for instance, in our union or in the Scott movement, was not when we thought what would be the best thing to do, but when we acknowledged that we had many good things to do and we just randomly, now we do your thing, 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 to make sure that everybody kept feeling hurt, but also that our strategies constantly shifted because we didn't want to build an army or a fortress where you can do what you want, right? So to hire our guys ourselves up uh, and just have the power, but the, the intervention in all the different perspectives that comes from following these things, keep, keep people on their toes. It, and I think that is fem organizing to, to honor all these different possibilities and to make sure that all this, they, they get executed at different moments, right? Everybody gets their way in a way. Yeah. Yeah. That's I think that that's maybe the question of the crisis, but we can maybe come into it and answer those questions. Yeah. So Let's have our questions from Zoom first. Yeah, so there are two questions. Um, one from Banja. I hope I said it correct. Banja. Um, so <laughs> they say, uh, what kind of space for you is the future? Is it the fearful same old or the fragile possibility of an otherwise? What form of praxis would it privilege regardless of one's level of institutionalization? I can read the second one. Yeah, from Safit. Um, how are trans futures related to trans past and what might be the roles of cosmologies and rituals in our collective trans liberation? That was not from Safit. Yeah. <laughs> and there's also a congratulations at yeah. the bottom. <laughs> uh, thanks, nice question. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, obviously, the Franya, your question, the first part, no, we don't want that. Second yeah. part, yes, we want that. Yeah, I, I think like, there is an openness to that fragility in a sense uh, to, to hold on to each other, sometimes by caring for each other, or sometimes just refusing to let each other go a bit um, without having to build a new, a new institution. Um, and how would these practices look like? Well, the good thing is that we can do the future in the now, right? The good thing, we, we, we practice who we want to be like by doing it and not to say like, oh, there's this ideal, uh, idealized possibility in the future and we hope we ever read, read it, uh, reach it. I, hope, I don't ever hope we reach the ideal that we can think now. I hope by doing things differently now that we build better ideals in the way we go or better, build better imaginations when we go along with it. But we start by doing, and I think that is what transness is. Transness doesn't say like, oh, I'm going to wait doing trans until the binary disappears, right? Then it, then it really, we can be completely free. We say just we, we, 
we get going and we see where we end up. Like, it's so many different genders. Who cares by now? You know, <laughs> just, like, just they keep coming. Um, it's fine. You just have to get going, basically. <laughs> Um, maybe I'm going to speak to this question around like the the second the second question is about ritual. Just thinking about the role of the past. Thinking about because part of it is like uh, my my brain is really full of just like reading Rollo's of Rolando Gómez like for the last two weeks. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about the you know he's like we got to just end like we're destroying the contemporary right because the, the whole idea of the contemporary and the aesthetic context is like framed through this like. A modern colonial trajectory of history and so in the spirit of like what queer Marxism does as well I think like uh, although this ritual is also a side of this right it's about like what does it mean to like a like recover his histories 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 that have been buried in the past that have something directly to say to both the present and the future in a way that's also like, um, it's trying to like, it's like, a, it's skewering historical time to try and understand the relevance of the past to the present, or, you know, into this moment that we might find ourselves in or heading towards. And I actually also, I think like, <clears throat> the questions around like biocosmologies and ritual, like that's really key for that to happen. <coughs> and I don't think like, because I think like even saying like refusing this kind of like modern, like the normative modern, modern time scale, which I think is also like stark materialism is not necessarily done this, doesn't always do this either, um, is to also promise some other, is also to like commit to some other kind of cosmology. I can't, I, I like, I struggle to talk about this. I str struggle to say this out loud because I feel for me, it's like in some of my creative practice where I'm trying to like answer these questions. And again, like it's in a practice, it's not necessarily verbal, even though I'm a writer, right? it's my practice is about language. Um, but it is in this like, how does how do we build these interrelations with the past that are very much in the present and that's also conjuring towards the future? So it's a reconstitution of what present, what presentism or whatever is actually, that actually it's already past and future. And that it's and it's in this mix, intermixing in this moment. Um, I don't know if that's vaguely coherent, or I will select do nothing on my answer questions and he's not improving my health. All right, yeah. so we're sending a lot of time questions. So in the middle there, no? And my dish. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. I'm already thinking of assigning. <laughs> um, I have a question. This is maybe related to possibly the part about abolition that you make, and something that maybe in the context of Gaza and the context of violent crackdowns happening, coming that will happen, um, is kind of the question of self defense and these spaces we're seeing ensuring the, that we can continue to keep alive the multiplicity and relationality that's also constantly being infiltrated, demobilized, um, attempts to uh, infiltrate them, co-opt them, take them over, shut them down, crack, crack down on them. Um, where is the, how do you think around, uh, around defending those spaces as well? Um, and also, of course, there's some people go, in some, in some contexts, it has to be armed self-defense, but, uh, <laughs> You know, we're, and it's a question generally around abolition and the place of this kind of militants kind of defense of, of spaces because they so quickly, and it's not necessarily about their coming apart through the natural cycle or organizing, but through deliberate destruction of those spaces. Such a complex question coming here. No, I'd like, I'd like, I'd like, thanks for bringing it up because um, one of the things states do is they bring you on their terrain. Mm -hmm. So the moment we have a military invasion, it seems almost that the only thing is a military answer because uh, we find that just standing in front of the tank doesn't stop the tank, it just drives over you, right? So you start to, to, to need to move to the level of the state. 
Now, there is ways to try to combat that. Um, and for instance, if you look at the invasion of Ukraine, you see that they have not been very successful uh, in combating the equalizing force because Ukraine starts to behave uh, as a nation state. They, need, they think they need to. I don't, I'm not judging that. I just see it happen. And I audience partly through discussions with my friend Alexei Radinsky, with who I'm in, uh, in Red Forest. On the other hand, but I also owe to my friend David Munoz Alcantara, who is Maya and works with the population in Chiapas, mm -hmm. is that we see that the military response in Chiapas is over time guided by councils that are kept out of the military response. So what happens there is the, is the equalizing force that is maybe a, a, a militant self-defense uh, is kept out of the decision-making processes in order not to bring the hierarchy and the militarized thinking too close to the decision-making power. And I think over Ukraine, Chappas has made the wiser choice because uh, it is very dangerous to start to think like a nation state or a military hierarchy if you have no one to undo that. That is what I'm We're also thinking like possibly Rojava. Possibly. Possibly, Rojava. yeah. 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 I don't necessarily have a coherent answer, but I think I have a lot about um, this, the first thing that comes to my mind in your question is thinking about the work that my friends in Beirut are doing. They're a practical haven for us because so some of the money. Um, and, you know, since the bombardment of Beirut, they've been, you know, they're just like, so they're actually, so they're like a feminist queer arts collective. They have a space. They like gave up their space because the people who were trying to fund it were complicit in Israeli genocide. That was only this year. And, you know, it's just like there aren't many spaces for feminists in Beirut from what I've heard of them, you know, for young feminists to have even a space to come together. And so their work is really about this space making and then also trying to reflect that through culture. Um, but yeah, since my father and them, they've just been buying mattresses and handing them up to displaced families in, in Lebanon. And so there's something also in there which is that's you know that is also resistance, right? Mutual mm -hmm. aid is also resistance. Mm -hmm. And I think in there there's also this question around like what is the meaning of space? And on the one hand, to refuse literally like literally to refuse occupation by the proliferation of everything in that space and to both not seed ground but then simultaneously to have an, uh, you know the, the function of the undercommon you know as this dispersed continually moving not necessarily identifiable locus because as soon as we become identifiable that's when the state can turn up and arrest us or destroy our library and so that's maybe there's something in that that's about mobility mobility you know it's all the questions about privacy practical like how we practice privacy in our everyday lives as well and how we communicate and you know this, these are much bigger questions around who also who owns our means of communication we're on whatsapp right so it's, yeah 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 Kind of love? What was the question? Self-directed. Yeah, yeah self-directed yes. love. Yeah. Thank you. It's a really good to, to question. I think it's like that is this the because in, in refusing the or like saying the institution's not gonna save us, like we it is to say that we kind of only do have each other. And obviously on the, there's a contradiction in that, which is that maybe we're also in the institution trying to both like find each other, <laughs> but also um, not let the institution over determine our socialities, um, because that also prevents us from having the, the kind of like, building the kinds of collectivity and the kinds of 
like social relations, the relations, the socialities that we need. So, yeah, so social relations, like really sound Marxist. Um, yeah, Meke, you're- Yeah, we, we basically wrote a chapter about this. The, uh, <laughs> it's called Solidarity, Generosity and Love because we really try to deal with this question. So like, what, what, does, what does it do when we at first are generous to each other rather than critical to each other, but we first say, yes, I believe the best that you try to do. Uh, and then how, how can we, uh, and how can we build these, uh, how can we build the solidarities on, on love rather than on policing? Right, and that is what we try to think through, and it is a skill that is thankfully not the end skill, but it is a skill that is that is that we're able to start with, and I hope that the book will be irrelevant in, in like a year. <laughs> we'll start to do this. We have to write a new book because we learn so much, right? Uh, that is really the hope. So I, I like that you bring the self-directed love in because it is. Um, hmm. To be believing is the opposite of often the trans experience, where it is the suspicion that you meet rather than the, to be believed in. And I think that is why we started to write about generosity and love, because we see that the moment you are believed in, that somebody says, like, yeah, I'm with you, and it doesn't matter who is in the room, like, I'm with you, I, I come with you, I, I I'm, yeah, I'm, I follow you for the moment. Uh, so the, people fl flower, flourish, mm -hmm. it starts to happen. So the kind of the three verbs are like, well, yeah, generosity, love, attentiveness being the other one yeah. as well. So it's about these different forms of engagement and how they animate our relations with each other, you know. And none of them are kind of apolitical either. They're also reflective about like how those things can fit, like fail or like how we might need to be more reflective in those moments because um, we have really like positivist received ideas of what these things mean. Yeah. And so when we were writing about generosity, when we were working on this the section on generosity, I remember going to this was this this is 2023. I was like, oh, yeah. yeah, stuff happened in 2023. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I can't remember 2023. I was going to Berlin, I was chatting with a good friend or something, sorry, about this exact question. And we got into this dialogue around like, oh, generosity is great, but what happens when the social movement abuses your generosity? Mm -hmm. You know? And it's like, we can go forward and, and then we're like, no, we don't want to. Just because our generosity can be abused doesn't mean that we don't want to approach our social our practice yeah. and reflect it with yeah. it. Yeah. And then simultaneously, it's this question around like how to like that actually. Some Should we just summarize it so the people on Zoom can also hear what the question is? We, we were asked if we write about the, the way sheltered uh, deal with uh, transness and how they think about transness. 
the honest answer is no, we didn't. We didn't write about it. Could you do that? Yeah. Can I add to that responsibility? <laughs> Thanks. I think it's, it's very important and it's very good you bring it up. And it is something, you know, we, we have we had 60,000 words. Uh, it's one of the things we didn't do. And we, should, we could have done, we should have done it. But maybe now we could do that. Yeah, shout, shout out also to um, Mudral Woodbara, who's, who was running Edinburgh Women's Ages Trans Women of Colour, and who recently had to resign because of pressure from, from transphobes. And it's like in a climate where, because it's also like, where do the where do the transphobes try and organise, right? And like the, um, what do you want to say? Like the, that, the, the, that third sector space around like, uh, domestic violence, domestic abuse, uh, gender-based violence, like, has always been like a bastion, like one of the bastions of trans, like, like where transphobic feminists do their work. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's not to say that there haven't always been like queer and trans people who work in solidarity with other trans women or with trans people in general uh, within those spaces. Um, in term, I guess, I guess it's this. This is like all these questions are like when. You know, because the family's form of institution, right? Talking about like again, like the spaces where transphobia gets manifest and trans people get ejected from, right? Um, I think ultimately what we're trying to be like, oh, is if we just focus on the institution, which I think isn't necessarily a fault of our problem in like collective leftist organizing, but it is the problem. It is like how neoliberal society thinks of itself. Um, we miss the fact that it's in these social worlds, in our spaces, in our, in our, in like our communities or whatever, mm -hmm. um, where we do the work of holding each other when we experience these moments of abjection. And mm -hmm. so, and I'm not saying that's perfect. And you know, I think we've all had experience. Like some of us have had experiences there where we're like housing somebody who's homeless and they're struggling, and it's it's really fucking hard, you know. And yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. that's all part of the balance, like. Again, like how solidarity is what makes what makes the difference. And okay, cool. I think we should take two final questions. So you and there's one this question over here as well. Um, yeah, but you've so been waiting a long time. Do you have thoughts on the the limitations of um, collective care or something that works? Um, but how do you get beyond the sort of you know, the same trans people passing the same time that amongst each other, or sort of holding each other. There's all this resource locked up in institutions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we simply form care networks and support networks in opposition to them, how do we liberate that resource that we have that we can't provide ourselves? What can we do when solidarity doesn't come through? Which, let's face yeah. it, has not been happening. Yeah, yeah really good. Um, really good, I think. People in the institution should be the tap to open the resources out, right? It is always needed to happen because we both got jobs in institutions. Yeah. I was for a long time not, and then I caved. It's, kind of <laughs> it's like, um, because the thing, the problem is the resource. And the solution is not the institution, mm -hmm. but as soon as long as the institution has the resource, you have to we have to feed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, I think it's how it become practice. How does this theory become practice? Another question, I guess. It's it's makes it feel like on the one hand, like we all have to we have to collectively be of a binary hood. And like <laughs> on the other <laughs> hand, like we I think it's this thing of this is the trouble of, this is the problem of separability is what you're talking about. Yeah. Around the yeah, yeah like we end up stuck as a trans community doing the thing and we've only got each other to rely on. Which is also organizations that rejecting identity politics. That's the other problem there, isn't it? Sorry, say again. Or else we drown in the larger cis, yeah. cis organizations in the name of rejecting yeah. identity politics in the name of yeah. unity without having our specific oppression addressed. Yeah. There's a tension there too, that's everything. Okay. And this is it. So so the but the, the trouble is that in the trans collective autonomous organizing we do also get stuck thinking it's yeah. we've only got each other to say no. I've, yeah. I've definitely yeah. had that thought a hundred times in the last year. <laughs> like, but um, so but that's, that's not to say yeah. And particular yeah. Set of goals, set of feelings, but yes. Yeah, but that's exactly the reason we need to reach out 
because otherwise we get trapped in this in both like the like fiscal economics of our community and also the the like when I, I say fiscal as in like the money but also the labor also the support also all those other things that you know make a huge difference also the emote like you know think about this as, as in terms of effect of the community as well I think partly we write in the book also, um, I mean, it's partly maybe uh, a story that I've also very much lived, and I think you too, is to be somewhere the first trans fan. I really enjoy breaking into organizations. It takes a <laughs> while, uh, but it, you know, I find it um, an interesting thing to do rather than hoping that you come into an uh, organization where things work already. I find it way more because sometimes you come into an organization and certain sort of liberal politics has made it work, and then oh, it's actually oh, even more difficult. <laughs> uh, well, sometimes it is just okay to come into a clueless organization because you get an an incredible amount of power in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, and I do like using that. That is why I'm a union organizer uh, because it gives you a certain a point of pushing and you need to have people that have your back which is where your trans communities are necessary right yeah i mean like i am not you know for the only trans women so that sometimes it can feel that way yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but yeah it's the need to have yeah but it's convenient for me to be the only visible one because of course i sort of the institution by being symbol but also yeah. I don't have much power. Anyway, yeah. this is a but then you're also not a threat <laughs> because you're only one, so it is really a, a, a difficult situation, right? Mm. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right, so final question. Wait, I just want to check. Did this person read? Did you have a question as well? Mine was quite practical. I just wanted to ask when, when yeah. and where we can find your book because you saw the thing I just learned so much and I want to take it with me today. Yeah, Pluto Table at HM. It's not out, the book's out in like officially in two weeks, but they should have copies. We haven't been there yet. Yeah, yeah, it should be there. No, you don't. Yeah. Well, I don't want to interrupt the book plugging, but no, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> um, just maybe very quickly, maybe not. Um, one thing <laughs> I'm curious about is how you theorize maybe that so on the one hand the desire not to reinstitutionalize or form institutional structures in in organizing and things like that which I, I fully understand but then on the other hand some kinds of activity or organizing work that require let's say durability continuity scheduling those kinds of things and I'm not I'm not hearing that you're like no you can never make a plan or something oh, like that no. but how do you how does that part of the theorization of feminist kind of work with the openness part yeah. I'm really curious no we love organizing yeah and we love organizations don't don't misunderstand this. yeah we love organizations when the organization comes to institution there's a problem right and the durability, like the thing is, why why we put it out there already is that the one is making hierarchies mm -hmm. and leaning on the tools of hierarchization, purification, sticking to the direction, doing doing it in the right way. And the other form of fem organizing is, I think, to allow the embellishment, to allow to retrain yourself how to do it, because that is trans life. We constantly have to retrain how we do things. Not many people, I don't know if you noticed this, but not many people say like, hello, I'm genderqueer. It was more like five years ago, genderqueer was around. Right? Now people are not lying. I mean, I had to be a gender bender, a gender blender before I became a genderqueer. You know, I had many different identities. I even had to identify as lesbian at some point. Can you imagine how tough my night was? <laughs> so, but these are forms of technologies of relation, right? Because these words, they are ways to organize how we get together. And that is that is why these words change, because they keep reorganizing how we get together. I'm very happy we have non-binary now. It will also go, and that is great. Yeah. You know, as a, as a thing that we move through, and the durability, because at the same time, you see the trans movement saying like, but we've always been here, we've always been here, right? You get that movement. That is the durability. The durability is that you can change shape and still be present. And there's something about the, again, and if we're like, if, we, if we're not saying it's, if we're, if we're absolving the institution of its responsibility to maintain my history, or we're, no, let me say this again. 
if we know the institution's not going to preserve our history or is not going to do any of this culling work, and obviously, like, you know, we work on archives and stuff, so we can't, we, we're not complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, it is to say that it becomes all of our responsibilities to do that whole thing in the long term. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Cool. I'm just thinking okay. of all the organ like all of, all the all the little bits of infrastructure that get built through through organizing, mm -hmm. but you know, not necessarily the institutional way. And that's yeah. it, all those forms of holding. Yeah. Linux. I know you love Linux, so mm. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> can confirm. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, um, we cannot hold this space any longer. So we, um, but it uh, leads me just to thank uh, you two, thank um, Michalina, Bruno, Susanna for helping organize and hold this yeah. space. Um, all everyone go and get the book um, in the next building, Bernard Gallery, the book market. And uh, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. People at home, people who are on Zoom. People on Zoom, thank you for being there and bearing great, with us. Great to be there. Some of these bidding hearts in the chat. That's Thanks, great. huge congratulations. Thank you. And... Should we close the Zoom? No, no, no. Yeah. Don't think about it. <laughs> Yes, we're coming like the way we're coming like the chat. Oh, okay. Okay. Read the chat. Yeah, sure. I think it's here. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoy your uh, Thank you. Thank you. Telling them to enjoy the no, I I I was thinking of the top of the top. But you can have to do the first one.